There's been a lot of talk about the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, often referred to as Obamacare, usually by those who are not a big fan of it. And my goal here is to not take any political sides and hopefully give an overview of what all of the debate is about and what this Affordable Care Act is all about. And I'm going to start with the most controversial part, and this is the individual mandate. And this is the idea that you either have to get insurance or pay a penalty or a fee or a tax. Penalty, which is now being referred to as a tax by many folks. And the, and the idea here, insurance, the idea here is that there are obviously many folks who are uninsured right now. And when they get sick, especially when they get very sick, they still get health care. And in particular, they will go to the emergency room. They will go to the emergency room, and that is quite possibly the most expensive part of the healthcare system to interface with. So there's kind of a moral argument here is that one, these people are getting sicker than they need to get. If they had insurance, then they would get preventative care and not get that sick. And then there's a financial, or I guess you could say a fairness argument, that these people are getting sick going to the emergency room. They have to be given care at that emergency room. The hospitals bear those costs, and then eventually the, hosp the hospitals recoup those costs by charging more for all sorts of other services, which eventually go back to the people who, do, who are paying for insurance, who actually are paying for the health care. And so if you have an individual mandate, it'll clear things up a little bit. People will have to essentially pay for the health care that they are already getting. Now, the argument against the individual mandate is that this is the government putting into law saying that people have to buy something, in particular that they have to buy health insurance. Now, the counter argument to that that many people make is, well, there's something similar going on with car insurance. If you want to drive in most states, you have to buy some type of car insurance or at least show that you have the financial ability to pay any liabilities that you might have if you get it into an accident. Now, the counter, counter, counter argument to that is, well, Car insurance is 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 not a is is something that someone or driving is something that someone chooses to do that you don't have to drive while in the case of health insurance this is something that this is every human being in the in in the in the in the country is being forced to get. I'll leave it to you to decide where you sit on that and what what balances what other issue. And now obviously if you're going to decide whether you want insurance or you whether you're going to pay a penalty or a tax, you have to figure out how high is that penalty or tax going to be on you? Or if you want to figure out if this is a fair situation, you have to think about how high is that penalty or tax going to be. And the current provisions say that by 2016, and this is when the full penalties take effect, you're going to have to pay the maximum of either 2.5% of income, of income, or $695 for an individual and $2,085 for a family. And there are exceptions. This will not this whole individual mandate won't apply to you if it, have getting insurance would cost you more than 8% of your total income or if you belong to a religion that does not participate in the healthcare system then it doesn't apply. And also, you will never have to pay more than 8% of what it would cost for you to get a health insurance policy. But these are the general policy, the general penalties. And just to get an understanding of it, if you made $100,000 and chose not to get the insurance, you'll the 2.5% is $2,500, which is more than either of these numbers, and so you will pay $2,500. If, you, if your household makes $50,000, then the 2.5% would be less than this here, and so you would, pay, you would pay this number right over there. Now, the other provisions of the Affordable Care Act really are all around, well, if we want people to get insurance, we need to make it easier for them to get insurance. And the biggest deal, at least in my mind, is this one covering pre-existing pre-existing conditions. Right now, if you have a pre-existing condition, you have a severe form of cancer or something else, and you don't have insurance, and your employer does not cover it, or maybe you're unemployed, and you try to get insurance on your own, you're likely to either be denied, or if you are offered insurance, it will be ridiculously expensive. And that's because the insurance company knows that they're going to take a huge loss on paying all of your medical expenses. The, the Affordable Care Act says you can no longer base the premiums or whether or not you're going to give someone coverage based on pre-existing conditions. People will be given charged premiums, which is essentially how much you pay for a policy, based on age, age, and geography. So if you have two 40-year-olds, 
one one of whom has has the misfortune of having cancer and the other who does not have any pre-existing condition and they both live in let's say in 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 Virginia under this they would pay, pay the exact amount of insurance or they would pay the exact insurance premium these other two points once again just make it easier to get insurance Right now, if you've ever tried to get insurance, you'll see that it's hard to compare and contrast policies, really understand what you're getting and what you're not getting. And so this part of the act says that every state will set up these insurance exchanges, which allow a little bit more transparency on, in terms of buying and selling policies. And then this final part right over here, and this is just an overview, I'm not covering everything, not all of the details, is the idea that, well, the government will also subsidize people getting policies, especially if they are in lower income, if they're in kind of a more difficult financial situation. Now on top of this, if you're deciding whether or not you support things, if you say, oh, well, this might be a good idea, or maybe you'd think it's a bad idea because you don't like the government forcing things like this, there's also the issue of, there's also the issue of the cost. And this whole thing, even though there might be savings in terms of, of, of lower medical care because people will get preventative health care and things like that, there is still a net cost to this. And this is going to be primarily paid for by increasing increasing the amount, the essential Medicare tax for high net for for people with larger incomes. So it's really going to be larger, larger Medicare revenues. Medicare revenues or Medicare taxes on people with larger incomes. Larger incomes. And this is estimated to generate about 200 billion a year, 210, whatever. There, there are different estimates here. But that's going to be a bear most of the cost. And on top of that, there are some extra fees on insurers. And there's a what's called an excise tax, which is a, a tax that tends to be a large tax, tax on a specific product on what they call Cadillac policies, these policies that are very, very, very generous uh, uh, to kind of make up some of the cost of all of this. So once again, not going to take any political sides on this, but hopefully that gives some clarity about what people are actually debating.